2014. Okay, so let us begin with a homage to the Buddha. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Okay, good morning everybody. And today we'll be taking or study the sutta number 124 in the Majjhima Nikaya. This is called the Bakala Sutta. It's a discourse with a monk named Bakula. And as I mentioned last week, if you want to see the way Bakula is depicted, at least in the Chinese tradition, when you walk up the what's called the Bodhi Path, that's the stone walk going from the parking lot to the big Buddha hall, you see along the sides of the path there are statues of 18 arahats. And on the left side, it could be somewhere around the sixth or seventh up, you'll see one figure with a short beard sort of staring out like this, his head turned to one side, and on, on his side there's a fierce looking animal that looks something like a cross between a lioness and a bulldog. <laughs> and that is supposed to be the venerable Bakula. And amongst the foremost disciples of the Buddha, that is, the Buddha appointed different monks, well, different monks, nuns, lay, male lay disciples, female lay disciples. He appointed, well, he established a number of categories and then appointed from his circle of disciples the foremost disciple in each, each area. And Venerable Bakula was appointed the foremost disciple with respect to good health. <laughs> so if you want to get healthy, if you have health problems, <laughs> or you want to assure yourself of good health, you can go Namo Bakula Bakulasa Terasa. <laughs> Homage to the elder Bakula. <laughs> okay, according to the commentary, the name Bakula means two families. The word two in Pali is actually Deve, and the word for family is Kula, but sometimes I think because Pali is based on vernacular languages, the word Dve gets turned into Ba. And so when you have B plus Kula, you get two families. And the commentary gives a story, a background story, to explain how Bakula got that name. And as I often say about commentaries, commentarial stories, when I relate them in class, I usually cross my fingers and keep them under the desk or behind my back. <laughs> and so you could do the same as you're listening. <laughs> okay, according to the story, okay, Bakula was born into a good family. I think someplace upriver from Bar. Benares, Varanasi. And then after he was born, 
one day when his nurse took him to the river to bathe, she placed him in the river and she was bathing him, and then some kind of fierce fish, maybe like a shark, so I don't know whether they have sharks in the river Ganges, but some fierce fish came down the river and she became frightened and she lost her grip on the boy and he went floating down the river. And so she had to report to the family that she had lost the son and of course they were upset. But it happened that a big fish swimming in the river saw Bakula, uh, this young boy, and took him to be some delicious meal and swallowed him. But because Bakula had a lot of merits from previous lives, he wasn't chewed by the fish, but the fish just swallowed him in one gulp and got him down into, the, into its belly. <laughs> and Bakula remained there through his, the force of his merit and his spiritual power. Okay, then as the fish continued to swim down river, it came to Benares. And then a fisherman caught the fish, a big fish, and sold it to a housewife in Benares. And as she took this big fish and was preparing to cook it, she cut it open and pulled it open. And of course, the housewife and her husband, for a long time they had been trying to have a child. They had never succeeded. Now, they cut open the big fish and open, pulls open the belly. And what does she find inside but a beautiful young boy, body fully intact, alive. And she thinks like this is her blessing for some past merits. And so she takes out the young boy and she tells her husband, my dear, we have a son who was born to us in the belly of a fish. Okay, and so they started to bring up the boy. And then, of course, they told their neighbors, and then word spread, and it spreads from one family to another, going all the ways up river, till some, the original family up the river hears that this family in Benares had bought a fish from a fisherman, and inside was a little baby boy. And so they realized that must be our son. <laughs> and say, so they go down to Benares and then they ask, inquire, where is that family that found the baby boy inside the belly of a fish? And eventually they are directed to this household. And so they come to the family and they say, oh, they see the little boy, they say, oh, that is our son. It, he belongs to us. But the family that adopted the boy, from, that took it out from the fish, said, no, we got this boy from the belly of a fish. It's ours. And so they quarreled and disputed. And finally, the two families went together to the king of Benares and reported their conflict. And the king said, well, you both have sound reasons for considering the boy to be your own. So to settle the conflict, let's say that he belongs to both families. So he's a two-family son. And so they worked out an arrangement whereby for four months the boy would remain with one family, then after four months, he would go over to the other, they would bring him down to the other family. They would nurture him for four months. Then after four months, bring him back to the first family. And so in this way, the boy was nurtured by two families. And even when he reached maturity, He had built for himself two residences, 
one on the property of the first family, another on the residence at the residence of the other family, and he would pass his time alternating between the two residences. By this time he was a wealthy young man. He would be accompanied by his, according to the commentary, the dancing girls. Whoops. <laughs> and according to the commentary, he spent 80 years <laughs> living in this way till in his 80th year, he encountered the Buddha's teaching. He heard the Dhamma, I guess, from the Blessed One, the Buddha, and then he became, he decided to go forth and he became a monk. Okay, now this sutta, if we take a look even at the first paragraph, we say, thus have I heard on one occasion, the Venerable Bakula was living at Rajagaha in the bamboo grove, the squirrel's sanctuary. Do you notice anything peculiar in this first paragraph, this opening paragraph? Wait, wait, I don't come to that yet. Just the first few sentences. Exactly, exactly. Usually the beginning of the suttas, even when they concern some other monk, it will say that on, such a, on this one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling at, could be Rajgir, or or a savati. Yeah, I'm just taking as an example sutta number 127. This is on page 1002. You see it begins, Thus have I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living at Savati and Jeta's Grove and not the Pindika's Park. Okay, then the rest of the sutta, there's no mention of the, of the Buddha at all. It all takes place as a conversation between um, the monk, Venerable Anuruddha, and a carpenter named Panchakanga. And then there's another monk who's drawn into the conversation, but no further mention of the Buddha. But because it takes place while the Buddha was alive, it, refers to the Buddha in the opening paragraph. But this sutta takes place, okay, when, it, when this sutta opens, there's no mention of the Buddha at all. And if Bakula went forth when he was 80 years old, and later on, a few sentences down in the sutta, it says that the Venerable Bakula had gone forth, had been a monk now for 80 years. So first this would imply that he was 160 years old at the time the sutta takes place, which is probably the reason why he is praised as the foremost in good health. <laughs> and it certainly would have taken place after the Buddha's Parinibbana and in fact, we could be quite certain that it would have, that this sutta would not have been included in the compilation of the canon or of the text that took place at the first council at Rajgir, supposedly three months or six months after the Buddha's passing away. But rather, this sutta would have been incorporated into the collection of discourses probably at the time of the second council at, um, at Vaisali, perhaps a hundred years after the Buddha's passing. Okay, so the sutta begins, it says that Achela Kasapa, a former companion of the Venerable Bakula in his lay life, 
went to him and exchanged greetings with him. Then after exchanging greetings, he sat down to one side and he asked the question of the Venerable Bakula. Now it seems to me that this figure, Achela Kasapa, is, I don't know whether we can identify him as a precise historical figure, because the name Achela Kasapa is used in connection with a number of discourses which take place in different places and with quite different settings. The word achela means one without clothing. In other words, he was a naked ascetic. And there's an achela kasapa who questions the Buddha about dependent origination in Sangyutta Nikaya chapter 12 sutta number 17 he comes to the Buddha and asks whether a sentient being whether it's the same sentient being who does karma and receives the result or whether it's a different sentient being who creates karma and receives the result, then the Buddha answers him in terms of dependent origination. And then this Achela Kasapa gains faith in the Buddha and asks the Buddha for permission to go forth and become a monk. And then the Sutta reports that he became a monk, went off and achieved arahatship. Then there's another Achela Kasapa who has a conversation with the householder Chita, Chita the householder, in Sangyuta Nikaya Sutta number, it's chapter 41, I don't remember the Sutta number. And so it seems that there are either, it's, there are a number of naked ascetics called Kasapa, which seems unlikely, or just this f figure has been taken somewhat symbolically just to function as a kind of I don't know, a figurehead, you could say, to serve as somebody who questions a particular member of either the Buddha or a f disciple of the Buddha. Okay, so Achela Kasapa now comes and asks the Venerable Bakula, how long is it since you went forth, since you left the household life to become a monk And Venerable Bakula answers, 80 years since I went forth. So again, as I said, that makes him 160 years of age at this time. Okay, then, <laughs> then Achela Kasapa asks a rather mind-blowing question. <laughs> he says, friend Bakula, in these 80 years, how many times have you engaged in sexual intercourse? <laughs> so obviously he doesn't, if the question is historical, he doesn't understand anything about the rules of monastic life. But at the time of the Buddha, there were some so-called ascetic communities which weren't pledged to celibacy. For example, there's sutta number, I think it's 45. This is on page 406. No, actually, it's the passage, the full passage on page 405 that in section three, it says that there are certain recluses and Brahmins. So these are samana, which means ascetics, those who have renounced the worldly life. 
But their doctrine and view is there is no harm in sensual pleasures and then they take to gulping down sensual pleasures and they divert themselves or amuse themselves with women wanderers who have their hair tied in a top knot. And then they say, why do some other ascetics speak about future danger and sensual pleasures? Pleasant is the touch of this woman wanderer's tender, soft, downy arm. Okay, so maybe a Chela Kasapa thought that the <laughs> Buddhist bhikkhus were also followers of this kind of doctrine. And so he asked this, it sounds a rather outlandish question, in these 80 years, and he's asking this, an 80-year-old man, <laughs> how many times did you, since you went forth, did you engage in sexual intercourse? And then Bakula replies to him, you should not ask me such a question, but rather you should ask me this. In these 80 years, how many times have perceptu perceptions of sensual desire arisen in you? In other words, what, how many times have you some perception, has some perception arisen in you in which you would grasp upon the attractive and beautiful features of a woman and by doing so this would arouse some kind of thought of sensual desire? or actually at this point it's just some perception, some sensually enticing perception, not yet even the thought of sensual desire. Okay, and then Bakula replies, in the 80 years since I went forth, I do not recall any perception of sensual desire to have ever arisen in me. And now we come to a little paragraph which is inserted into the text. And this would come from the compilers of the discourse. And this passage reads that in the 80 years since he went forth, the Venerable Bakula did not recall any perception of sensual desire to have ever arisen in him. This we remember as a wonderful and marvelous quality of the Venerable Bakula. And when we read this paragraph, we can say, or at least I can notice, two things about this paragraph. One is the use of the expression, wonderful and marvelous quality. Does this ring any bell in you? Not in the sense of the Buddha, but that's one of the points that I had in mind. To, to have a wonderful and marvelous quality doesn't mean that one is fully enlightened in the sense of being a, you know, a sama sambuddha. Bakula, of course, is enlightened in that he's an arhat. But having wonderful and marvelous qualities is not a unique feature of a, of a, a fully enlightened Buddha. But this is what the point that you brought up is one of the relevant points. And this is that probably the reason why this sutta was placed in this position, following the sutta on the wonderful, marvelous qualities of the Tathagata, is because they both use that expression, wonderful and marvelous qualities. Something else that's interesting about this passage, but maybe it hasn't become clear at this point, but we're going to find this passage is repeated after each section, and I think maybe by the end of the sutta it will become clearer, the kind of, at least from one perspective, 
a kind of function that is fulfilling. Okay, so first, Bakula says that in these 80 years since he became a monk, he's not aware of having any sensual perception arise in him. Then he continues and says, in these 80 years, I do not recall any perception of ill will, that's anger or hatred, or any perception of cruelty, of harmfulness to have arisen in him. And then after, each of these actually constitutes a separate statement on its own. And each of those separate statements is followed by that repeating passage, the refrain, that this we remember as a wonderful and marvelous quality of Venerable Bakula. Okay, then paragraph six, section six, Bakula says, in the 80 years since I went forth, I do not recall any thought of sensual desire to have arisen. Then he continues, I do not recall any thought of ill will, any thought of cruelty or harmfulness to have arisen in me. So this is, I think, taking the process of cognition one step further. So often, or at least in various places in the suttas, we find statements to the effect that perception is the basis or condition for thought. So when we perceive in a particular way, that perception or sanya triggers a particular kind of thought or vitaka. Vitaka is what I translate as thought, yeah. and sanya is perception. And so, for example, the sensual perception, okay, the man sees a woman, for example, and you know, first he might notice pleasant smile, bright, shiny eyes, nice flowing hair, nice figure. So those are just perceptions. Underlying them is the tendency to sensual desire. And so once he sort of collects a number of perceptions like that, then a thought of sensual desire could arise in him. And then the thought will motivate action. So you go up and try to think of a nice opening line. Didn't I meet you in Los Angeles last year? Or I don't know, I'm not so clever with opening lines. <laughs> Maybe that's why I became a monk. <laughs> um, 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 um. <laughs> Get away. <laughs> Idiot. <laughs> You're so sweet. <laughs> You've got to do better than that if you want to, <laughs> to get me. <laughs> okay, so sensual perception leads to sensual thoughts. Then, you know, sometimes things in a situation, maybe the way somebody opens his book or sits down in his seat or just the way they walk or just the expression on their face creates, you don't even know the person, but you just get the perception, and already there's some kind of, like your perceptual field starts vibrating. And, you know, it starts flashing red. 
and then the person continues to start to behave in that way, and then it leads to thoughts of anger and ill will, that you don't like that person. And so this is perception, sort of conditioned by ill will, generating the thoughts of ill will. How it works with cruelty or harmfulness? I don't know, anybody have any ideas about that? How a perception? Oh, yeah, actually that's a good idea, yeah, yeah. Well, of course, they're, they're underlying there, but okay. Let's say a guy has gone hunting and he sees, it's the deer hunting season, he sees the deer in the woods, and so maybe he thinks, okay, that's a good target, and then that will motivate the thought of taking up the gun and shooting. Yeah, well first, first, well first the perception, a particular perception, will generate the thought, and then the thought will lead to the action. Of course the thought will be then, could trigger, will sort of technically the thought will then trigger the volition, and then that's the chaitana, and then the chaitana, the volition, is what motivates the action. Okay, so these are the classical formulation for the three types of unwholesome perception and unwholesome thought. That is perception, sensual perception, call this angry perception or perception accompanied by ill will, and perception accompanied by cruelty or harmfulness, the tendency to inflict harm and suffering on others. And Bakula says that since he became a monk, none of these, he doesn't recall any of these having arisen in him. And when he says he doesn't recall this, you know, it's a kind of modest way of saying that it's actually never taken place in him. Okay, now we come to the next section, which is a composite of a number of separate passages, each one of which, we have to remember, comes, occurs in the original as a separate statement, and each one is followed by that sort of round of applause. This is a wonderful and marvelous quality in the Venerable Bakula. Okay, he says, since I went forth, I do not recall ever having accepted a robe from a householder, and then this goes with the next one, ever having worn a robe given by a householder. Okay, now there are two ways in which monks get their robes. Sort of the old ideal, the original ideal in the early days of the Buddha's teaching was for e monks and even before the Buddha established the monastic Sangha for the ascetics who were wandering over India to just find discarded pieces of cloth, particularly by going to the charnel ground where they would, when a person dies, sort of like beggars, vagabonds, criminals, you know, people who are not cremated by their families, they would just wrap the body up in a cloth and throw it away in a charnel ground where the body would be devoured by jackals and hyenas and crows and other creatures, wild dogs. And so the ascetics would go to the charnel ground and take these pieces of cloth that have been abandoned, and then cut up the pieces, sew them together, and dye them. They would use bark or leaves or wood from the trees, boil, 
the boil the wood and bark to get a dye which is somewhat this color and then they would put the cloth in and then wear it as their robe. Okay, but when the Buddha was teaching at a certain point, lay people asked whether they could offer ready-made robes to the, to the monastics and the Buddha permitted this out of compassion for lay people so that they could get merits by offering the monks their simple requisites of their robes. Well, of course, after they got them from, from the cremation, from the charnel ground, they would, of course, they would wash the robes off <laughs> in the river or of ponds, you know, and then you know, clean them with various cleaning materials, chune them with ground up limestone, and then they would wear them. They wouldn't just put them on right after taking them off the corpse. Okay, but those who wanted to continue to maintain the original ascetic spirit would refuse to accept robes made by householders and they would insist on continuing to observe the practice of making the robes themselves. In fact, in, particularly in the forest tradition of northeast Thailand, the monks still make up their robes. But the cloth is usually off. They don't go to the charnel grounds. But the cloth, the plain white cloth, is usually offered by householders. But the monks become very experienced and master tailors. They know how to cut up the robes into the correct size pieces of cloth, how to sew them together using sewing machines, not threading themselves, and then dyeing the robes themselves. Okay, but this monk, Bakula, you'll see that he's maintaining the old ascetic ideal, and so he refuses to accept robes from householders, to wear them given by householders. You know, if he sees another monk has a robe that was offered by a householder, and that monk says to Bakula, will you accept this robe from me? Bakula will refuse. He'll only wear robes that he's made up himself from pieces of cloth. Okay, he's... But it's here it says he, he's never cut a robe with a cutter ever. He's never sewn a robe with a needle. Excuse me? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> ever having colored a robe with dye? Yeah, I'd have to, I, I didn't look at the commentarial explanation of this, but it's a bit problematic. <laughs> Excuse me? It's the only thing I could think of. But then that would be a concession from... Excuse me? Oh, she, she's asking whether he was naked. No, actually, going naked is prohibited by the Vinaya. I'm, I'm wondering if he's talking about the use of the cutters instead of the needle, and that's what he must do. Perhaps that is the case, though a needle is included with what's called the eight requisites. So, you know, when anybody is ordained as a monk, they get a, a parcel or a package with the eight requisites. That's the three basic robes, the belt, it's four, the filter for filtering water, a strainer, water strainer, the razor for shaving. Oh, the arms bowl, of course, the arms bowl, and a needle and thread. Okay, three robes, belt, clo it's a cloth belt, bowl, arms bowl, strainer, needle and thread, and razor, yeah. Anyway, we can <laughs> leave this as a mystery. 
Okay, then he's never sewn a robe at the Katina time. The Katina is an event which is held at the end of the rains retreat, the three month rains retreat, which usually lasts from the day after the full moon of July till the full moon of October. Then after that, there's a one month period in which on a certain day, the monks designate this as the Katina day when they take pieces of cloth that have been offered and prepare them into a new robe. And they all work together to prepare that new robe. It has to be prepared within a 24 hour period. So they all work together. But Bukula says that he's never worked on making a robe during the Katina time. And he's never made robes for his companions in the holy life, for his fellow monks. Yeah. Well, don't forget that many of the other monks would be arahats and they made robes. They worked together with the other monks to make robes. Yeah, I don't think so. I think these are all, all intended to sort of elevate the figure of Bakula as the model of the ascetic practitioner. But certainly, as I was telling, answering Fowey's point, he couldn't have been going naked because that is prohibited to go in pub naked in public. Eighty years? Um, and when one is wondering, you know, a good part of the year in tropical climate like India, the robe tends to get sweaty, and so one will be washing the robe fairly regularly. Yeah, but that's because the <laughs> it's being kept underground. You know, it's not being subject to the changing outer conditions. No, we're talking about the robe, not about the mental state. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so I'm just doubtful that he could have worn the same robe for 80 years. I mean, in Sri Lanka, when I was living in Sri Lanka, you know, where we have to wash the robes fairly regularly because they get sweaty in the climate. A robe can last, okay, three or four years, even with patches and being re-dyed. Then it turns into bed sheets or towels. Yes. It seems a little problematic because the Buddha laid down, you know, precise instructions for the design of the robes, and so to conform to the model or the pattern that the Buddha laid out, he would have to find a robe that had belonged to a, to a Buddhist monk. But then that's taking what's not given. Well, if the robe is cast off, it's not cons considered taking what is not given. Taking what is not given actually means taking something which is the belonging of another. Yeah, that's, it's, yeah. Yeah, but still, because it's not considered the property of another, it's not, it doesn't come under the definition of taking what is not given. It's considered discarded material. This, I don't know. I think we'll just have to pass this question up, not take further time on it. Okay, now we come to...